Okay, let's look at the best temperature record we have, which is the near surface troposphere record from satellites, uh, specifically the RSS, Remote Sensing Systems from 1979 to the present. Has it been warming over the last 20 years? Well, the last year's 2016's massive El Nino, which is here, did give the alarmists something to shout about, and there was moaning all year that we were wrong, that uh, the climate's warming, there's no pause, and so on and so on and so on. It was endless. But as we see, as always, it was just like the 1999, uh, 1998 El Nino, which is temperatures have now collapsed back down to uh, 1984 temperatures, virtually the same, which is an anomaly of 0.2 degrees. Nothing unusual. So it's just another El Nino, as we all knew it was. And I've plotted here... Uh, this is the Wood for Trees uh, website, which gives you, uh, which plots the data out for you. It saves you a lot of time doing that yourself. I've plotted the um, linear trend here for the last 20 years, 97 to the present, 2017. And as we see, the rise is 0.1 degrees centigrade over that 20 years, which is 0.05 per decade, which is not statistically significant. Anything 0 0.05 degrees per decade or less is not uh, a statistically significant increase, which of course relates to 0 0.5 degree rise per century. That's roughly what we got in the 20th century about that amount, about 0 0.4 degrees it was, uh, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5, there's arguments over that, but in the 20th century that's what we got, and we're getting a very similar rise so far in the 21st century, which of course is not alarming at all. Now why did we get the reasonably fast rise from the 1970s over here, to 2000. Well, probably to answer that, we need to look at, let's say we'll look at Hadcroft 4. And for this one, we'll go back to 1850, right back to the start of the data, plot the graph for that. And we'll get rid of this. Uh, averaging for the last 20 years. Okay. So this is the data set. Now, as we all know, the um, Hadcroft 4 has problems with it, like all the surface temperature data sets, or the three surface temperature data sets. They've been homogenized, altered, and basically, this, uh, in the 21st century here, this level here should be down here around where 1940 is. So that's an exaggeration. But anyway, if we ignore that and just look at the general trend, we've got a trend up from 1850 to 1880, down to 1910, up to 1940, down to 1970, and up to 2000. And this is a 30-year down cycle and a 30-year warming cycle regularly. It's the 61-year Yoshimura, which is very common. It's seen right throughout uh, the proxy data and the measured temperature that data for hundreds of years. It's a very, very common climate cycle. So this rise from, let's say, 1950 to 2000 that the IPCC are talking about, it's just the upswing in the Yoshimura. So to blame that on CO2 is a little bit uh, disingenuous, to say the least. There's no reason to assign that to CO2, other than CO2 was rising at the same time. There could have been a slight effect from CO2, but 
It's hard to say whether there was or there wasn't, but anyway, if there was, it still means that climate sensitivity to CO2 is very low. So we're not going to get to the two degrees caused by man-made CO2 like the IPCC are always crying about. It's not going to happen. If we take a lot of action through Paris and other agreements in the future, and we don't get to two degrees as we want, then of course they'll claim that they were successful. And we should thank them and kiss their bottoms because they saved the planet. So it's a no-win situation if we pursue this action. Uh, for real science and real scientists, it's a no-win no -win situation. So the best thing to do it's to stop wasting money on these actions that aren't going to change the climate and aren't going to benefit us or the climate. They're just going to cause the deaths of poor people around the world and not affect the climate at all. You know, I always get people who say, oh, the 60-year cycle doesn't exist, or this, that, and the other. I mean, there's many, many climate cycles. That's just one of them. Just because the IPCC doesn't mention it, doesn't quantify it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. They only mention the 11-year Schwab cycle. And it all comes back, as far as the 60-year cycle, it comes back to Yoshimura, uh, this paper printed in, uh, uh, in the literature in 1978. You can look it up, solar cycle, period, amplitude, relation, etc., etc., now, there's a lot of other data out there. You could look at SEMI, orbital resonance and solar cycles. Uh, there's a very interesting, it's a very long paper, but there's a very interesting part in that, which is here. Uh, oops, I made it too big. Okay, this shows climate cycles, solar cycles and climate cycles. This is the orbital angular momentum of all the planets and the sun. As you see, you've got the 934-year uh, climate cycle, clearly shown here, warming in the Roman period, cooling in the Dark Ages, warming in the medieval warm period, cooling in the Little Ice Age and the current warm period, which is now. And it even shows the 60-year climate cycle superimposed on that longer cycle, the bond cycle, the thousand, roughly 1,000-year thousand bond cycle. You can see it here, 1880 warming, 1910 cooling, 1940 warming, 1970 cooling, 2000 warming, 2030 cooling, 2060 warming, and so on. It's a regular cycle. Nothing is going to change these cycles, no matter what we do with CO2 or whatever else. These are going to continue. Let's have a look at the uh, cloud cover from ISCCP which is a tropical cloud cover and global surface air temperatures from HADCRU3. They are plotted together here um, in climate view, which is very, very handy. You can see the cause of the warming of the 1970 to 2000 warming, which was the reduction in cloud cover, in tropical cloud cover from around 66% down to about 60%. That is a big change. 6% in cloud cover is a big change. It's a rather large forcing, hundreds of times greater than the CO2 forcing uh, that, that, that the alarmists are talking about. Let's have a look at some official, in quotation marks, Data, this is from AR5 Working Group 1. And it shows the relative forces, relative radiative forcing between man and natural. All these 
are supposedly man's forcings. And in opposition, we've got a little bit of solar irradiance, which is 0 0.05 watts per square meter since 1750. That's what it's supposed to be. Man-made forcings, 48 times larger. That's what they say. A factor of 48 times larger. I mean, it's just an absolute joke. Now, of course, to arrive at their TSI variability of 0 0.05 watts per square meter since 1750, they've had to flatten out the record and fudge it. So, anyway, if you want to look at some real science instead, uh, I would recommend Yinstead and Solheim's paper, which has just been published in the last few months. This is it here in New Astronomy. It's called The Influence of Solar System Oscillation Variability of Total TSI, basically. And again, it's a long paper with a, a lot of interesting stuff in it. But if you look at the TSI reconstruction from 1700, it goes even lower back to 1680. But if you say 1357 watts per square meter in, in 2000, it was 1362 top of atmosphere, that is 5 watts per square meter divided by 4, uh, because of the roundness of the Earth, so you get 1.25 watts per square meter, multiply that by 0.7 to get rid of the Earth's 30% albedo, you get about 1 watts per square meter of forcing since 1700, of course, that is 20 times greater than the IPCC have put in their forcing estimate for uh, TSI. That's just one problem. So they're a factor of 20 out just on that to start with. Now, if we also look at things like solar cycles. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, th this is the um, Schwab solar cycle. So it's the common 11-year solar cycle. We've got the highest solar activity in the last half of the 20th century for 11,000 years. Well, some of the researchers say 4,000 years, but anyway, it's thousands of years. It's the last time we had this grand solar maximum that we had in the last half of the 20th century. And that is now winding down. There's a lot of inertia in the climate system. So it's staying warm a little bit longer than you might expect. But the prediction is for much less solar activity in the 2020 onwards, as you see here, right through basically to you know 2050 or even after that. Okay, let's have a look at one reason out of many why the CO2 enhanced CO2 hypothesis is wrong. The prediction is for a hotspot 10 kilometers up over the tropics. Of course, it didn't happen. This is what happened. Nothing. This is RSS MSU from um, the about that height, 10 kilometers high in the upper troposphere. Here's a 10 kilometer one. Zero warming. It's completely flat. 17 kilometer from RSS shows a cooling since 1979. So the hot spot's not happening. Uh, Clough and Iacono from 1995 show us... Um, that in the troposphere, CO2 does very little. But in the stratosphere and the mesosphere, it creates an enormous amount of cooling. Uh, ozone causes some cooling as well, but it causes warming. Ozone causes warming in the, uh, in the lower stratosphere. But CO2 causes cooling at all heights above the tropopause. Just have a quick look at sea levels. The claim, of course, has been always been that sea levels are accelerating. Sea level rise is accelerating due to man. 
man's made uh, man's anthropogenic emissions. This is from the R5 working group one, which clearly shows that is not the case. Uh, we've had a rapid period of sea level rise from as you'd expect, according to the climate cycles from 1910 to 1940, 1950, and then a relatively stable phase for 30 years till 1940, 1970, and then they're rising again. So the acceleration is, in the last 30, 40 years, was faster than 1940, 1970, but not faster than 1910 to 1940, 50. That's in the data from the IPCC reports. So I hope you got something out of this.